that are coming. Thanks, Dad. So we got recording in progress. Today is being recorded, um, so that'll be nice for those who, who can't join us. Um, and so, Zach, whenever you're ready, if you want to pull up that slide deck. There we go. Are we seeing it? We are seeing it. All right. Great. So. Yeah, a lot of, lot of familiar faces, and many of you we met in person this year, so that's really cool. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, thank you and, and welcome everyone uh, to our, our latest UAS CTI consortium meeting. Uh, we, of course, have the, the regular players of, you know, Alina, Diana, myself, and then uh, a ton of names that now we not only recognize the name, but have got to, to meet some of y'all in person, um, just going through the, the list of participants there. And uh, it's, it's great to see you folks back. And I hope uh, everything's been well for you. Uh, with the start of the semester since our, our last meeting and everything. Um, yeah, got, it's just so great to see everyone. Um, Zach, thanks for starting that off. Um, for those of you who may be joining us the first time, I'm Diana Robinson. That was Zach Nicklin. Um, I'm actually project manager with the UAS Integration Office at the FAA and lead the full UAS CTI program and then co-chair the consortium with Zach. And the consortium, if you're not sure, is made up of the two-year and technical colleges, along with industry, state, local, tribal governments, uh, UAS education service providers, those who are more for profit, but that are a huge part of what we're trying to do with this integration of drones and meeting work, uh, workforce um, as it continues to grow. Um, we met the end of July. I saw... Um, Grant Brewer and Will Austin are both here today, and they presented back uh, at the end of July. Uh, great, that was great presentations. If you missed that meeting or any other meetings, uh, most were recorded and are located in the reposit uh, repository on the National Center for Autonomous Technologies, which we call NCAT, and that's where uh, Zach is associated with that. So, Zach, go ahead. Uh, if you have a few more words, and then we'll pull up the agenda. Oh, absolutely. I think I got the, the welcome out of the way there. So we'll go up the agenda. And I'm, I'm working off of three screens today. So when I'm looking away, I'm actually looking at the presentation screen. So I do that as well. So we've got welcome and remarks. Um, we're going to have an update on these regional uh, events, the droning on regional editions from Alina. Uh, we also have other guests with us today. Uh, Scott enough. Gore is going to, sorry, we're kind of tag teaming. Scott Gore is going to talk about um, a recruitment for the UAS CTI program. We have Amelia Fox, who um, she actually presented at the Droning on Southern Edition and was just fascinating the work that she's doing. And she hasn't asked today. Yeah, then we got uh, Kevin Morris from the, the FAA uh, office. He's You'll, you'll know him as the FAA drone guy. He does all the videos and, and communications there. Um, he's another another Minnesota guy, so he's probably a little cold today too. Um, and then we'll we'll finish it out with some uh, you know what's next Q and A and and any closing remarks. Um, as usual, we'll happily stay on for a little while there and and chat about what's going on or any questions anybody may have. Um, so at this point, uh, and if it's all right with you, I'll go ahead and introduce uh, Alina George. Um, a name that really doesn't need much introduction because everybody knows Alina. And if you don't know Alina, well, I mean, you're, you're just missing out here. So um, Alina, um, she's, she's going to talk about it again, our, our droning on and our, our regional edition update there. Um, I see she's bringing her screen up there. Um, these droning on events have been absolutely great. We had one in our Great Lakes region not too long ago. Got to see uh, Alina, Diana, Venus, and and some of the team there uh, in person, which was absolutely great. They brought in our regional administrator and uh, just a, a lot of great conversation and then some great educators. We had a, a room full of students there. Um, so it was a good time. I'll, I'll let Alina, you know, take it from there. I just realized I needed to unmute. Um, hi, everybody. So I'm going to be talking about the outreach and engagement plan that is coming up for 2023, of which we are hoping that you all will participate. So super excited for what's coming up this year. Uh, there we go. It's done the thing. 
So Drone Safety Day 2023, um, we are starting to work on this and get this socialized uh, within the FAA. So we are hoping for this date to be in March or April. We are going to be working with NCAT again this year. Um, we are going to be planning some agency events and we're going to be streamlining the event registration so that it is easier for everybody to get involved. Also, we are going to be using a lot of the same um, messaging from last year. So if you've got anything from last year, feel free to reuse some of that. And of course, fly right is going to be used again. So if you remember, this was our catchy little phrase from last time, uh, register your drone, interact with others, gain knowledge, have a safety plan and trust and train. And we are super excited for um, drone safety day next year. This year, it was awesome. We had over 40 different events in person. Um, we also had events in three different territories um, and not including the US, three other countries. So we are hoping to exceed all of that for next year. And as we get more details, we will make sure to keep you all informed. But let me talk a little bit more about droning on. Um, this is something that we have come up with. And this year, we actually went out to four of the different regions. Now, the FAA has divided the country up into nine different regions. And our efforts have been to go out to all of these regions uh, to promote safety and safety culture in drone operations, um, both commercial and recreational. Uh, we want to foster greater public acceptance and greater understanding of UAS operations. Um, and we wanna build these strong working relationships um, across the FA, state and local and tribal governments, uh, businesses, industries using drones, and of course, academia. So we are working in partnerships um, with the nine regional offices and with UAS CTI schools. These events are all free, um, and typically they're about two to three days. It depends on, depends on the school. So, so far this year, we, oh, this is the upcoming schedule, sorry. Um, so upcoming for next year, we currently have one solid date, and that is for our Eastern region. That is going to be April 27th through the 29th in New Jersey. So if anybody's around there in that area and wants to get involved, please let us know. Um, we are also going to have events in the Southwest region, Western Pacific, Alaskan, and Northwest Mountain regions. So again, uh, we are working with the regions right now to figure out dates and locations for all of those. But everybody on the regional side is so excited. Um, and again, if you are in any of those areas in those regions, please let us know. We would love to have you and, and meet you. Uh, this is exactly what Zach did when we were in uh, the Great Lakes region. We were actually in North Dakota and Zach was, you know, only a, a state border away. So he came over um, to hang out with us and present it. It was a great day. So to talk a little bit more about the ones that we have already done, um, we did the central region first. We were in Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, we moved then to the New England region, which was in Maine, which was really cool. Um, the photo that you see there is actually from Maine itself. Um, we worked with the University of Maine at Augusta at their Brunswick Aviation Campus. And when they say aviation campus, what they really mean is it's a hangar on um, a decommissioned uh, naval air base, which was amazing because we got to see all parts, different sides of aviation. We had the planes in the hangar. There were planes that were taken off the runways. We had drones that were flying around. Um, and it, it was just a really, really great time. Um, after that, we went, like I said, to North Dakota um, with the Great Lakes region. We were at the University of North Dakota in Grand Forks. It snowed a couple of times, 
uh, I guess when I say snow, it flurried, but you know, it, it was not yet snow time. So it was very exciting. Um, and then finally this year, we did go to the Southern region. Um, we were at North Carolina State University in Raleigh, and that was really, really excellent. excellent. Um, we, Justine uh, Hollingshead, who is the, um, our POC there, she was able to actually set up and demonstrate the NIST courses that they teach there. Um, and we were able to bring students out for that. We're talking high school students. We had something like 50 um, who were there. And for many of them, they, this was the first time they were on a college campus. It was really heartwarming. They got to see the drones in action. Um, and we were really, really excited about that. All of these events so far have been fantastic. Um, we are seeing registrations uh, upwards of 200 at this point, which is really great. Um, and a wide variety of people are interested in coming to these events. So we're, like I said, very happy with how these have been so far and cannot wait for more next year. And with that, um, I was talking a little bit about our Southern region and I would actually like to introduce um, somebody who I actually met for the very first time in the Southern region, Amelia Fox from Mississippi State University. Uh, Amelia is, um, she is the assistant clinical professor developing workforce related curricula for precision agriculture, which is super important these days. She has authored seven textbooks on GIS, remote sensing, and small UAS technologies. Um, she is currently creating an open source repository for small UAS training programs under the AMA protocol. And we all know how much I love open source anything, so this is fantastic. Um, Amelia is also the lead investigator developing virtual reality teaching tools um, that she uses for training uh, for both undergraduate and graduate students um, that move from sim technology to real uh, infield fixed and rotorcopter air uh, air aircraft flight training. I was trying to say too many words at once. Um, so with that, I would like to bring Amelia on and I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Thank you. Let me see if I can share my screen with y'all. Be right with you. As Alina mentioned, I'm Amelia Fox. And thank you for the introduction. Um, so workforce development, precision egg, un uncrewed flight. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about our research and some tools we'd like to share with you all. And the ask I have today for you is if you're interested in the Academy of Model Aeronautics or the AMA protocol for training, uh, I want to hand over what we've done to your organizations and hopefully bring you together under uh, an umbrella in which you can make use of it. So there you're looking at a photo of some drones, we have our students build and fly in precision egg. They buy those parts off of eBay and Amazon. Okay, so we originally are uh, from the Bel Air Flyers Club in Bellingham, Washington. Uh, uh, that's where the original training came from. And that's where we got the AMA protocol that I'm going to speak to you today about teaching flight. Fixed wing first, of course, then rotocopter. Uh, we also received some help down here in Mississippi from Mr. Dennis Lott, who runs UAS Solutions. And he helped us really advance our program to a higher standard. And how we do this is basically um, our students meet online for the first five weeks of every semester. And they receive, um, they receive online training. We, we loan them a simulator, a real flight simulator. We meet like this as in a WebEx and they broadcast their transmitters so I can see their hands, what their hand motions are. And we train them in fixed wing, which is left hand dominant, rudder 
fixed wing flight. We train them in fixed wing first, then we move them to a tricopter, which is mutually dominant. And then we move them to rotocopter, which is right hand dominant. Um, their hands are coached. And at the end of five weeks, we begin dismissing them at the crack of dawn. They go out and meet at the Mississippi Horse Park where they take fixed wing training. I'll show you some pictures and rotocopter training. Uh, at the end of the semester, they have completed all of their part 107 uh, training. They've gone, and so they're ready at the end of the semester to not only fly fixed wing rotocopter, and they're ready to go take their part 107 exam. So there's my, uh, the airfield where we fly. We fly on the old Mississippi Horse Park racetrack. Um, we use a trainer, uh, a supplementary trainer, because I can't take 20 students alone. So we train one of the students out of the core of pilots uh, and then we pay them a, a nominal fee to fly uh, airplanes all of the time with us. And it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful thing to do. Uh, we have to fly in the mornings here because uh, the winds are heavy in the afternoons. We're, we're lucky if we get afternoon flights off. So our morning flights, you'll notice the students are dressed pretty warmly, um, but they're very proud of their efforts. They're very proud of who they are and what they accomplish. We take faculty as well as students and we take students from any program, not just Precision Ag. So we take students from aerospace and geosciences. It doesn't matter, uh, forestry. Forestry was a big one this semester. Um, the students, after they build their quad, they learn to fit them with a Micasin sensor. They learn to go out, collect data. There's some students here building the, uh, the aircraft. They learn to solder. They learn to uh, do all kinds of sorts of things to build these aircraft. And finally, they go out and do their collections, their advanced flight, their missions. And then uh, in their year two remote sensing class, they learn to make variable rate prescription maps, topographic maps, um, just a variety of different maps in QGIS, ArcGIS, and PIX4D software. So what we do on the side, though, is we study neurodivergence. So the students, when they enter the, the introductory course, they take a 60-question survey. It's from the big five factors inventory. And we, we test their extroversion, their agreeableness, their openness, their conscientiousness, their neuroticism. If you keep that word in mind, because I'm sure any of you who've taught students to fly have recognized that some students are really neurotic, frightened to death when they fly. And finally, Machiavellian is a trait that's not in the big five factors, but we've added it to this survey. And uh, Machiavellian is the opposite of neurotic. The Machiavellian students are cowboys. So let me just lay this out in a, in a way that you might understand it. Uh, a person who's neurotic, uh, a person who has low conscientiousness is inattentive. A person who's Machiavellian, uh, open. A person who's pervasive is the opposite of an inattentive person. A pervasive person is one who's really hyper-focused. Typically, these are your very, very good students, very, very good students. And finally, you're ingenuous, you're very agreeable students. They'll do anything to please you as an instructor. Well, uh, and you, you must have all had a neurotic student, you know, going to flight. They, you must have felt that this student's <laughs> really, really feel nervous the entire time. And an attentive student can actually be of value. We found out that inattentive students can see the horizon, they can see the aircraft, they can see the, the surface, and they can gauge their attitude, their altitude, their direction better than those who are hyper-focused. People that hyper-focus tend to look at the aircraft and they don't pay attention to the environment. The inattentive students actually do a really good job looking at the entire environment. The Machiavellian students are really fun to teach. They're just, they're just cowboys and cowgirls. They are crazy fun to teach. They're easy to teach. They also tend to crash a lot of planes because that's how they learn, through mistakes. The open student is one who is just really open to new experiences and is exactly the opposite of neurotic. They, they are just gonna try and try regardless of how they feel about the experience of flying. A pervasive student, again, is one who's really extremely focused. And sometimes all they can see is the aircraft going through the air. They cannot see the surrounding environments. They wouldn't see an, an approaching aircraft because they're so focused on the one ideal. And finally, an ingenuous one is who's so willing to please that they may not, they may not um, be willing to take risk. 
like a Machiavellian. They, so these are opposites. Neurotic is opposite of open, inattentive is opposite of pervasive, and ingenuous is in the opposite of Machiavellian. And we test these personality characteristics. Then we teach them to fly. We rate their flight on flight cards, and we associate their flight cards to their anonymous surveys through student ID numbers. We just attach them. And what we see is this pattern. We see this pattern happening over and over and over again. We have the majority of our students are either neurotic, ingenuous and pervasive on this one side, or they're inattentive, Machiavellian and open on the other. I call them brother, son and sister moon from the canticles of St. Francis, because what you're looking at is this pilot who on the, on the left side really wants to please, but doesn't necessarily have the ease of flight that the pilot on the right, the sister moon has. And this is not a gender-based thing. This is really a personality-based experience. So the sister moons are actually easier to teach, but they're gonna take more risks. They're gonna have more accidents. The brother son, they learn much slower. They also tend to really like, the brother son students really like the quad or the rotocopters because of the autonomous features that stabilize the aircraft and just allow them to maneuver and manipulate the aircraft. Whereas sister moon, students really like fixed wing because of the experimentation and the freedom of flight and the joy of doing loops and rolls and aerobatics. There is another pattern that does show up very rarely. And at the top, we would have the such neurotic pilot that I would never get this student off of a simulator. They would never be allowed to go to the field. I've only had one in seven years of training that was not allowed to go to the field because they could not pass the basic flight simulator theory training. I just came across another Uber pilot. This is my third or fourth in seven years of training. Uh, these are people who do not need me to teach them to fly. All I have to do is teach them how the airplane works. They are naturally able to fly on their own. Really a neat experience to come across those people. So in this picture, I use this picture as an example. Uh, I'm gonna name from left to right, we have Sister Moon, Sister Moon, the perfect sitting down in the brown shirt, the perfect combination of brother, son, sister, moon, you know, just very balanced. Um, sister Moon, brother, son, and brother, son on the right, two brother, sons on the right. It is not a gender-based issue at all. It is just the personalities of the individuals. Um, and these first two on the left, they really crash some planes, but they really learn well. They're, they're, they're some of the best pilots we have in the university and they're hired in the university now as pilots. So um, I have made available online at this website, you can Google it. it's called Future Growers Technologies and go to the documents page. On the documents page is uh, a link to our virtual reality for greenhouses and that's where our virtual reality for flight will go as well. But also on the right hand side, there's a link to videos for how to train with a simulator, how to incorporate simulator training into your program under the AMA protocol. Now, the you know CTI is adopting the top uh, AUVSI protocol, and I've just got funding from the university to go ahead and take top certification, and we'll add that back to our program, but it is not the standard in which we fly. AMA believes that you teach flight by teaching how to fly like a real aircraft, and you respect the aircraft like a real aircraft. And so the, the way we teach is no different than what they would teach if you went up and took discovery flights and, and flight training in an aircraft. You're learning left-hand dominant or rudder dominant fixed wing and right-hand dominant or prop dominant um, rotocopter. So um, I'm available to speak to anybody a bit about this. What I'd like to say is, um, if anybody's interested, we will continue our study. I can only take 20 students a semester, so our data set is quite small. Um, but if anyone were interested in adopting the AMA training protocol, um, I would love to think that we could do a workshop at Mississippi State University or at a community college up north and bring faculty in and teach you the AMA protocol, teach you how AMA uh, teaches flight. If you can't do that within one, uh, two weeks, perhaps less than one month, our field training, not only will the SIM training be online, but our field training videos will be online as well. We're making all of our resources available for free. Anybody can have access to them. 
Uh, we, you know, you don't, you can't hold the AMA in a can. It is an open source organization, with the exception to membership. Um, but they've been teaching flight for a hundred years. They know how to teach flight. Um, nobody has really codified uh, AMA uh, flight protocols until now. We we have it in a booklet. We have it in, uh, you know, printed literature but uh, we'd like to share it. If anybody felt that they wanted to do some kind of workshops, like I said, we could do a March, a middle March workshop here at Mississippi State and bring in five to 10 different CTI schools um, and train you out, uh, get you ready to go. Or we could do a summer workshop if the FAA was willing to sponsor that. Um, wouldn't want to do it here in the South though. You couldn't, you couldn't pull that off here in the South, it's too hot. Your little foam planes, you know, can only fly from the crack of dawn till about 8 a.m. and then they wear out. If I can answer any questions for you, I'd be happy to share. Um, go ahead and use that website uh, and let me know if there's anything I can do to help. Thank you, Amelia. And maybe some of you will take her up on that offer and check out her site as well. All right. So in case you're wondering, the UAS CTI program grew to 97 last week. We had, we've had three schools recently join. Uh, the last two were Ohio State and Williston State College. So if you're here, uh, Williston State especially, welcome. Um, but we want to double that number. So we have this recruitment initiative that we're just getting started with. Um, and to share a little bit about that, um, is Scott Gore. Scott, who actually was uh, a, a big part of the initial launch, he was our uh, legislative liaison at that time, and he pulled together those associations, organizations, and others uh, that really got us started. And we are just so fortunate that he came to our outreach and engagement team, and he has really been, uh, you know, moving and shaking, to say the least. He's been reaching out to different schools at conferences. Um, and so, Scott, really happy that you're here. Tell the, the group a little bit more about yourself, what you've been doing, and what our recruitment efforts are all about. Sure, Diana, happy to do that. Thanks for having me at the meeting today, and uh, great to see everybody. Uh, as Diana mentioned, I serve as program manager for strategic engagement on our outreach team in the, in the UAS office. Um, and thanks to everyone for all your work as part of this consortium and greatly appreciate your partnership and, and all the work that all of you are doing. Um, as Diana mentioned, we want to achieve, uh, reach a level of 200 schools participating in the program by the end of this fiscal year. And we're hoping all of you can help us with that recruitment initiative and, and effort. Um, you know, we know the, the demand is there as the growth in the industry continues. FA is building out the regulatory framework for drones. And just the, the pace continues to advance and the use of technology, the technology uh, advances across a range of industries and continues to expand. So we see a lot of opportunity and potential in this realm for, uh, for schools and for students that are part of the consortium. And so <clears throat> doing a lot of outreach and recruitment uh, lately. Um, uh, you heard about the regional outreach events that Alina just briefed on a couple minutes ago. Um, that's been one way we can recruit new schools into the into the program, and we're hoping to uh, that that a lot of you can participate in in those future events, and and hopefully have been at you know Zach and others have been at some of the events already completed this year as well. Um, we're also attending various conferences and, and other events to spread the word about the consortium and about the UAS CTI program. The FAA was out at the uh, National Association of State Aviation Officials conference in September. Um, where we talked about CTI program there, and we were also at, last month, we were at the University Aviation Association conference um, that was in October to recruit new schools and uh, encourage, uh, encourage folks to get in contact with us and join the program, among other topics as well at those, at those events. We've also been doing some uh, booths, some conference, or some booths at, at recent uh, STEM, STEM conferences and higher education conferences. There was one that Alina and the team just did at uh, the American Association of Colleges and Universities uh, had a STEM conference in Arlington, Virginia, just a couple weeks ago, and we're also planning to have a, a booth at their annual conference for that organization, uh, their annual conference coming up in January um, out in San Francisco, I believe, 
in the community college realm specifically, uh, we are planning to have a booth at the American Association of Community Colleges, uh, their, their annual event scheduled for the beginning of April um, out in Denver. And I don't know if, any, if anyone's familiar with that, with that event or planning to attend, um, but I'll paste the link to it here in the, in the chat. Um, hopefully some of your schools are familiar with that event or planning to attend. If you are, we'd love to see you there and work with you and uh, connect and talk about how we can recruit even more schools into the consortium. Um, and I mentioned, I mentioned Naseo a couple minutes ago. Uh, part of our attendance at that conference and, and our ongoing work with Naseo is part of a formal agreement that the FAA has now in place with Naseo in the form of a memorandum of understanding uh, on specifically on drones and, and advanced air mobility, um, you know, to work together on outreach and engagement and um, you know, education uh, out to state aviation directors. And so we're working with them uh, pretty closely to try to grow this program as well and trying to uh, encourage all of our state aviation uh, you know, departments and, and officials to help us uh, in this endeavor as well. Uh, so those are those are a couple of the big areas we're working to expand the consortium and expand the program and help us get to that number of uh, 200 schools this year. Um, but we're also looking for other ideas as well from all of you, from the existing members in the consortium. So I guess I, I did have a, a question for, for the group that's that's here on the call today, is what else can we do together um, to keep expanding the program? And what else, what else do you all think the FAA should be doing more of to bring more schools in uh, as this as this whole new sector of avi aviation is expanding and 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 really uh, growing uh, in the industry. Um, so if anyone has has some ideas of of what uh, you know what what you think we could be doing more together to encourage schools to participate, that would be we we can talk about some of those now. We'd love your thoughts and ideas. I think uh, Zach uh, Nickland has has some other events uh, that should be on our radar, and we greatly appreciate that, Zach. And any anything else that that the group has ideas on, um, we would love to to hear how we can keep recruiting schools into this important consortium. So maybe I'll pause there for a minute and see if anyone has has thoughts. I see a couple of items in the chat, but feel free. And JC, if you want to come off and ask your your question or any other thoughts. No, I was just wondering with the uh, Mississippi State university program do you end up uh coming on coming away with a uh a, a fa license um remote pilot license because yes me, yes yes uh you, you the first there's five courses that they can take they all lead to the bachelor's completion so anybody with a two-year degree that wants to transfer to mississippi a, uh, state university for bachelor's completion can get a uas emphasis degree the, uh, the five courses are egg flight tech one you get your part 107 and you learn introductory flight egg flight two you learned commercial coptering uh, and fixed wing which will add the top ua uh, auvsi standards to that course as well um, the class three, the class three, they learn to build the quad of fly the quad, collect data, and then there's ag remote sensing one, ag remote sensing two, where they learn uh, how to use remote sensing data, GIS, cartography, and then mapping skills, QGIS, ArcGIS, and Pix4D. Thank you, and and you come a lot, you come away with an FA pilot's license then. Well, there, part 107 certification would be the proper term. We awesome. don't call we, we don't call it a license. We if, if a student, many of our students who are very talented pilots, uh, uh, unmanned pilots, they'll go off uh, two miles to the east uh, to the west and take part 61 as well, and then they will fly for RASPIT. We'd love to have you all here to Mississippi State University to see Assure UAS and the RASPIT Flight Laboratory, which is a leader in the FAA safety uh, development. So yeah. I'm glad you mentioned Assure uh, uh, Mississippi State. Is, they actually host the Assure program website. Uh, but we're fortunate that they are participating in the CTI program as well as that that program, which is all about research. And Scott, you were asked if you'd be at AUVSI, so I'm assuming the exponential. Yeah, which so would I, be, thanks, Grant. We hope we have a team, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, typically the, the FAA has a has a booth and participates heavily in the uh, exponential conference that AVSI puts on. 
Um, that's going to be in, I think, the beginning of May, also in Denver, about a month after the American Association of Community Colleges uh, event that I mentioned earlier. Um, so yes, I think we'll, you know, I don't, I'm not sure if I'll personally be there yet. Hope, I hope so. Um, but our team definitely will be. And we would love to keep uh, recruiting new schools into consortium and, and CTI program at that, at that event. Scott, just to add on to your, your push for 200 schools from the FAA, um, you know, the, the folks in this group, I, I think would be a, a really great resource, you know, as you start talking to your colleagues in other schools and you recognize that they have, you know, UAS programs and, and maybe a fit for CTI, um, you know, please send them our way. You know, we, we'd love to have them be a part of the community. Um, I, I know I personally learned so much from from all the great people around here, um, even outside of the meeting times. I, I know that I'm talking with with some of you other folks, uh, you know, uh, about day to day stuff or, or you know, wh whatever it might may wind up be. So, I mean, this group is an excellent resource and uh, would work great as an ambassador for the program. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree 100 percent, Zach. Um, if you're at your school, if you're part of a community college district or you're part of a, a community college system, and others in that in that system want to learn about drones or uh, explore, you know, starting drone courses and programs at their at their colleges, or maybe they already have some in, at other campuses in your uh, community college district. Uh, have them get in touch with us. We would love to talk with them. We would love to, uh, you know, we could organize maybe a, a, a briefing for all for representatives from all the campuses across the community college district that, that you're part of, um, or or neighboring community colleges that uh, even if they're not in your district. But you just you know know of other other colleges that might have interest in your in your area. Uh, we would love to talk with all of them. So feel free and send them our way to Diana or or myself directly, Alina, Venus, uh, our whole team, or even our we have a shared email box for CTI that I'm sure all of you are familiar with. You can send them there, and we would love to talk with with any of those uh, any of those other campuses that that uh, you send our way. Yeah, I'm still always amazed when a school surfaces that we've not made contact with. It's been a very grassroots effort from the beginning, just, you know, networking, uh, reaching out through email, uh, through meetings, but um, don't assume that we know about them. If you know of a school, please uh, send them our way and then we'll, you know, try to schedule a meeting um, with them for yeah. if they have a program and then help them start a program because there are a lot of great resources, especially on the NCAT site for that. All right. Diane and Scott, I'll, I'll jump in here. Tyler Dobbs with AMA. Hey, and if AMA can be a resource, uh, we have programming for college and university level UAS operations. So um, I can drop my email in the chat here. And if AMA can help out in any way, we would be happy to do so. Thank you, Tyler. You're welcome. Yes, thank you, sir. Greatly appreciate it. All right. Well, we will move along to our, our next presenter, which I'm really excited about today. Um, we do have a consortium planning committee that meets periodically. We discuss what topics we'd like to have at our meetings. And also it includes suggestions that maybe you have given us through email or when, when we meet. Um, but one of the topics that everyone wanted to know about is the status of remote ID. Uh, we've also been hearing about the FRIAs and CBOs, as well as, you know, um, drones being um, certificated, getting that certification. And so I reached out to Kevin Morris, and early on, Zach mentioned that some of you know him as the drone, drone guy. He's been around a while and doing some fabulous uh, social media posts on our web, on our social media sites. Um, he's, you know, been at different conferences. I hope you've had the opportunity to meet him. Uh, he is a communications specialist in the Office of Communications. I was fortunate to meet him not long after I started with the FAA. At that time, he was with Flight Standards. So he's got a great background and, and, and knows the answers or will get uh, explain when those answers will be available. So Kevin, I'm going to pass it off to you. And thank you so much for being here today. All right. Thanks, Diana. I really appreciate that that glowing intro. I don't know if I deserve it, but I'll take it. It's Wednesday. It's been snowing here in Minnesota for three days, so I'll take any sort of glowing I can get. I, I do appreciate that. I'm going to uh, ask if I could share my screen here, uh, which will stop somebody else's screen. Apologies for that. Uh, so you should be able to jump into the presentation uh, that I want to go over today. So uh, I got a lot of stuff to cover, uh, so I think I'm going to move this relatively quickly. Some of it might be very, very familiar to uh, a lot of you on the call. 
some of it might be a good reminder. And certainly some of it is going to be relatively new, especially when we get into the whole FRIA uh, discussion coming up here. I, I think that's going to be one of the highlights of the next 20 minutes or less if I can talk fast enough. But yes, that's me. Uh, as pointed out, FAA drone guy. That's not a name I picked for myself, but it was a name given to, to me by others in our office of communications. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, no, we, we, uh, we found another restaurant too. It's a really good place to go have breakfast. And uh, Oh, somebody's hot, Mike. All right, that's good. Um, I hope you get a good breakfast there. Uh, but uh, I hold an airline transport pilot certificate, certified flight instructor, remote pilot. I've also been at the FAA for 16 years, most of that in flight standards. And during that time, I was doing pilot certification, aircraft accident investigation, some rulemaking, certainly a lot of policy work. And then I got pulled into the FAA's Office of Communications. So I've really only been in communications with the FAA for a couple of years, but I do have a lot of background knowledge that, that helps them out a lot. But I wanna talk quickly, uh, a little bit of review on certificates. Uh, there's really three types of certificates that we're looking at right now. Their remote pilot certificate, your recreational UAS completion certificate, and your registration certificate. So I just wanted to touch on these quickly. Again, most of you are very familiar with it, but let's talk about registration because there is a common misconception out there that there is a weight limit for registration. I want to dispel that myth here right now. If you're flying under Part 107, regardless of the weight, that drone has to be registered. There is no sort of 0.55 pound thing for Part 107. So under Part 107, all those drones need to be registered. It's a one-for-one -one registration. The difference is if you're flying under Section 44809, which we call the exception for limited recreational operations, that's where you'll have the weight uh, exclusion for registration. Another big difference between registering under Part 107 and 44809 is under 44809, it's one registration number for all your drones. So if you're flying under 44809, you have 10 drones, it's five bucks, and that number can be on all your drones. If you're flying under part 107, it's $5 per drone. So let's say 10 drones, it'd be 50 drones if I can still do math correctly. And that number would also have to be individually put on each drone with this individual registration number. I do put our website up there because unfortunately, if you Google FAA drone registration, I don't think we make the top three. <laughs> I, I think the first three hits you're going to get back are companies that will take the burden of registration off your hands and register a drone for you for some crazy amount, it's not difficult. If you pay more than $5 to register your drone, you're going about it the wrong way. And I'll be happy to answer questions about that later too. Remote pilot certificates, we talked a little bit about this. This is something that we issue under part 107. You have to take a knowledge exam. They are current for two years and then you have to do recurrent training. But the good news is if, if you don't know, you're gonna be excited to hear this, but most of you probably know, we've made that recurrent test online and free. It used to be something you had to drive out to a testing center. Some people are driving four, five, six hours. Now it's just available online, it's free. If you already hold a remote pass certificate. And yes, if it's been four years since you've taken the initial test, you can still go online, take the recurrent test, and have your remote pilot certificate valid for another two years. But of course, that remote pilot certificate is for mostly commercial operations, nonprofit education, depending on what you kind of bucket you fall into. We'll talk about that in a minute. Public safety, uh, et cetera. The other certificate we talk about is relatively new. Uh, it's a not an airman certificate, but a completion certificate. So Congress tasked the FAA with developing an aeronautical knowledge and safety test. We finally did that, and we have roughly 17 or so FAA-approved test administrators that provide this test online for free. You can take it as many times as you want, any time of the day, and you can't fail it. What it does is it provides very basic information on how you can fly recreationally, now this is only under 44809, international airspace system. Now, one of the questions we get a lot is, if you hold a remote pass certificate, do you still have to take the trust if you want to fly under 44809? Answer is yes. Now, before you freak out, let me tell you why. There are differences in 44809 than compared to part 107. Probably the biggest one I can share with you is that under 44809, you could fly an 80 pound drone. You cannot do that under part 107. So because of those little nuanced differences, 
even if you hold a remote pass certificate, yes, you still have to take the trust. But I'm guessing anybody that holds a remote pass certificate will complete the trust in about 10 minutes or less. It's not going to be that challenging for you. So those are the certificates that you need to operate a UAS. And yes, if you are asked by law enforcement or FA personnel, you have to show those certificates to those individuals, the trust, the recreation, uh, excuse me, the registration and the remote pass certificate. But let's move on from those certificates as something that we're more excited to talk about or maybe less excited depending on your point of view, remote ID. What are we talking about here? Well, remote ID is coming. There, there's really no stopping it. We had an, a notice of proposed rulemaking a couple of years ago, over 53,000 comments. We listened to you. There are a few things we changed in the rule, but the end result is still the same. Remote ID is going to be a thing and it's on the horizon. So what are we talking about here? Really, we like to call it yes, a sir, digital please. license plate for your drone. It's going to have your remote ID serial or session number on it. It's going to have a lat long altitude. It's going to just transmit a bunch of, dare I say, ADSB-like data points uh, out to uh, a device that can pick up a signal. Unlike ADSB, it doesn't get plugged into a nationwide network. You more than likely will not be able to sit at home, pull up your computer, and see drones that are flying a thousand miles away. That's not the intent of what remote ID is. But there's a couple different ways we do remote ID. And it applies to anyone that requires a drone registration. So you got to think back to the slide I talked about when we talked about who is required to register your drone. Well, that means anybody flying under Part 107 has to register their drone, right? So you have to comply with remote ID if you're flying under Part 107. If you're flying under 44809, and if your drone weighs 0.55 pounds or less, then you would not need to comply with remote ID because your drone does not require FAA registration. The one exception to all of that, and we're going to talk about this a little bit later, is this thing called an FAA recognized identification area or FRIA. Uh, terrible name for what we're trying to tell you it is, which is a spot you don't have to comply with remote ID equipment. So FRIA equals an area where remote ID equipment is not needed. So what dates are we talking about? Well, manufacturers of drones were required to comply with producing standard remote ID drones beginning September of this year. So we're a couple months past that now. However, because we did not approve the first means of compliance, and I'm purposely not going down the rabbit hole of means of compliance and declaration of compliance here. It's a whole other presentation. But because we didn't provide a, a way for this to work until just recently, we are going to use what we call enforcement discretion meaning that if a manufacturer is in good faith trying to meet the rule, we have our discretion to not enforce or conduct an enforcement investigation for that manufacturer. That goes through December of 2022. What is not changing, and this is what I want to emphasize, what is not changing is the operator compliance date. So beginning September 16th, 2023, all drones that have to comply with remote ID, meaning they have to be registered, need to start broadcasting remote ID to fly, or they'll need to operate within a FRIA. So that date has not changed. So really from an operator standpoint, the big date we're talking about here is September 20, excuse me, September 16th of 2023. So what happens on that date? How are you going to comply? A couple different ways. There's something called standard remote ID. And this is just another way of saying a drone manufacturer builds in the equipment to the drone at the time of manufacture. Uh, this is something that can't be disabled, uh, can't be shared between drones. What's really designed to do is as a drone or RC aircraft rolls off a production line, it's coming with remote ID baked into it. The other way is more of an aftermarket piece, which we're, we're calling a broadcast module. So if you have a drone now and it's not going to be remote ID compliant or you do home built aircraft for whatever purpose uh, that, that may need to have remote ID at some point, there are gonna be broadcast modules, aftermarket add-on pieces of equipment that you can attach to that aircraft and comply with the rule. And with a broadcast module, you can move that around to different aircraft. Uh, so it's, it's a little bit different. One is done during production, one is done sort of aftermarket, but both will meet the rule. Okay, but what if you don't have it, right? What if, what if you don't have it or you don't want it? Uh, your only option at that point is going to be operate inside one of these FAA recognized identification areas. Those are going to be locations where remote ID is not going to be required. 
there are two types of groups that may apply for a FRIA. There are educational institutions and FAA recognized community-based organizations. And I'm trying to picture the smile on Tyler Dobbs' face right now as I say that, but those are the only two groups that are gonna be allowed to apply for uh, FAA recognized identification areas. So as an educational institution, uh, if you would like to set up an area where you would like drones to be flying without remote ID equipment, you have the ability, I should say, you will have the ability to apply for that. Uh, we don't have that site quite set up just yet. Again, the remote ID compliance dates not until September of 2023. So how do you know if your drone has remote ID? Well, we have a website you can go to. It's called our Declaration of Compliance website. You can see the address there on the screen. That's going to have your public DOC list and a couple of advisory circulars to help you maybe understand more about remote ID. But when you get there, you can filter through that list, take a look at the remote ID, find your drone, your manufacturer, you can click on view and it'll bring up a list of all the different serial numbers of that drone that meet the remote ID requirement. This list is growing every day, but it just people continue to add to manufacturers as they continue to add to it and add to it. So if you're wondering, check that list. But again, if it's not there, we have about another year before you have to really start becoming a little bit nervous about it. Okay, so now your drone, let's say, is remote ID. Now what? Well, eventually you're going to go into drone zone where you've registered your drone and you're going to update your remote ID serial number, not your drone serial number, your remote ID serial number. We're, we're going through some upgrades to the system right now to help out, uh, namely to filter out people putting in incorrect serial numbers. We want to make it as easy as possible. So I know we have some people from our support center on here. I believe what we're telling everyone right now is hang tight. Don't jump into drone zone and try to plug in your remote ID serial number yet. You don't need to do it. Again, September of 2023 is still a ways off. And we're going to make this system a little bit better, a little bit easier to understand. So there's less problems when people go in to that website. So this is the website here that you would go to. Same thing for the registering your drone. But let's jump into topic du jour, community-based organizations. This is something that has um, been a long time coming <laughs> uh, for, for many people that have been waiting. So the FAA has been working a long time in trying to meet Congr Congress's requirement that we recognize community-based organizations. So what the heck are we talking about and why is that important? Well, community-based organizations is not a new term. But what's new is the, the FAA's requirement to recognize them. So what we're talking about now when we say community-based organizations, we are talking about FAA-recognized entities. Uh, these are groups, organizations that apply to the FAA for recognition because they meet certain criteria, which I'm going to show you here on the, the next screen. They can also use their safety guidelines to meet 44809A2, which is one of the rules for flying under 44809. There's a, there's a bunch of rules, just like there are part 107. One of them is that the drone has to be operated in accordance with an FAA-recognized community-based organization safety guidelines. So it is important to be recognized as a community-based organization, and we expect a lot of people to make these applications coming in. But before you apply, you're going to need to make sure that you can meet the requirements. So the requirements for community-based organizations are laid out by Congress uh, in Section 44809H, technically speaking, and you can see them there on the screen. So they're not massive requirements, but one of the requirements that might prove most challenging, depending on what your organization would like to do, would be the comprehensive set of safety guidelines. Congress specifically mentioned that those safety guidelines have to be developed, quote-unquote, in coordination with the FAA. So while it's a, an agreement between the community-based organization and the FAA, there might be some give and take. For example, if you want to put in your safety guidelines, we're allowed to dive bomb cars on I-75 just outside Tampa. I don't know that the FAA is going to be that thrilled to see that in your safety guidelines. So most of the requirements are pretty straightforward. It's the safety guidelines where there's a lot of discussion between the FAA and the applicant on how that's going to work. Right. So how do you do this? You can apply through the drone zone, uh, same place you go for registration, some airspace authorizations, some waivers under Part 107. It's the same place you're going to apply for CBO recognition. So you're going to need to meet that statutory definition, probably supply, 
uh, supply some documentation to show that you meet that definition and submit your safety guidelines. The process can take up to 90 days. It's really just dependent on how many organizations are applying and how many people we have available to work with that right now. But a little bit about more about these safety guidelines. Congress requires that if somebody's flying under 44809, the exception for recreational operations, that they follow an FA recognized community based organization safety guidelines. It does not require them to be a member. So what we're envisioning is that we're going to have X number of FA recognized community based organizations. A recreational flyer is going to need to pick one whose safety guidelines are available and then use those safety guidelines as part of their operational rules for flying a drone. But it's very, very important. You do not have to join a CBO to use their safety guidelines. You just have to be able to say, I'm following AMA safety guidelines or XYZ safety guidelines. Whatever safety guidelines you're following, they have to be from an FA recognized community-based organization. And I know we have one as of yesterday. Nikki, I'll probably figure out who that one is. But what can CBOs do, right? So there's a few things. There's some benefits to being an FA recognized CBO. You can establish fixed flying sites in controlled airspace. You can operate over 55 pound drones in designated locations. You can charter, and this is important for a lot of people on this call, you can charter educational institutions. And that's important because under section 350, it permits educational institutions to operate under 44809, which could open up more flexibility in your curriculum, more flexibility in your programming if you've been chartered by an FAA recognized community based organization. So that's a big piece. Uh, there, you're you're going to see here in a minute uh, it, for the educational pieces what the other requirements are. You can also host sponsored events and equally as big as the third bullet point there is probably you can apply for those FRIAs, those non-remote ID equipped drone flying locations. So what about schools? Can schools fly under 44809? This is a yes, but answer. So if your organization, your institution of higher education wants to fly under 44809, you have to be listed as an institution of higher education. And there's a whole statute that lists institutions of higher education. Or you have to have an operation as part of a established JROTC program. And there's that third bullet point again. Or you can operate as an educational program that's chartered by an FAA recognized CBO. So again, here we hear that we have that FAA recognized CBO coming back into the picture. Now, moving on to the exciting stuff, free as versus fixed sites. I'm going to try to do my best to clear everything up here. We've talked about free as, we've talked about fixed sites, but I want everybody to understand right off the bat, they're not the same thing. They are completely different. So if you forget everything I say, remember this, free as and fixed sites are not the same thing. Two totally different things, right? Here we go. A couple of advisory circulars to help you understand the previous slide. If you like reading, here we go. AC 89-3 talks about FRIAs and AC 9157, uh, both of these just hot off the press, really talks about the exception for limited recreational operational aircraft. If you're going to be flying under 44809 or if you're going to operate as a CBO, you're going to want to be extremely familiar with these two advisory circulars. They are meant to help you through the process. Let's jump into it. FRIAs, FAA recognized identification area. This is where remote ID equipment is not needed. They can be in controlled or uncontrolled airspace. And it's important to remember this is remote ID equipment. You will not be able to turn off a standard remote ID. They're not going to come with an on-off switch or software feature that just says, well, I'll turn remote ID off for today's flight. This is the equipment we're talking about. Either your drone has remote ID equipment or your RC aircraft, or it does not. If it does not, you're going to need to fly in one of these FA recognized identification area. There are some operational rules associated with it. You cannot fly beyond visual line of sight in a FRIA. Both you and the aircraft you're operating must remain within the physical boundaries of a FRIA. And I'm going to spend some time explaining that here. And FRIAs aren't valid forever. 
about every four years, they'll need to be renewed. They're also not going to be made available wherever. The idea of remote ID is to help with the safety and security of our national airspace system. And if we put a FRIA in everyone's backyard, that doesn't really work to support the intent of having remote ID. So FRIA applications are going to be carefully reviewed by a variety of different people in the FAA to make sure that they're in the right spot, they're in an area we're comfortable with us not knowing where drones are, and that they're not right next to another one that somebody could just easily drive to if they wanted to fly. Now, what are fixed sites? Fixed sites are different. These, many people think of them as like model aircraft flying fields. That's a great example of a fixed site. Generally speaking, fixed sites are in controlled airspace. So what that means is, well, if I'm flying a drone in Bravo Charlie Delta or Surface Echo 2 airspace, I'm going to need an FAA airspace authorization. I don't want to have to do that every single time I fly or we meet here every Saturday to fly or my university has their training program at this location. We don't want to have to send up a bunch of Lancer. You can put in for a fixed site. That is essentially a standing airspace authorization. We depict these on UAS facility maps. Uh, there's three different types of flying sites. I'm going to go through those real quick here because it's not that critical, but you have fixed sites. You have special purpose sites, uh, which is if you're going to go above facility maps and things like that. Um, we have a new one for the AC that just came out, which is a sponsored event. But these are largely part of a CBO's benefit, if you will, of applying for these types of locations. But what I really want to spend time on is, is the difference between the two. I'm not going to read through this. Diana, I promise that we'll get this presentation available so everybody can take it home with them. Uh, it's, it's not something you need to memorize right now, but this is really just showing you that they are different. They're not the same. You're not going to apply for a fixed site and automatically get a FRIA. You're not going to apply for a FRIA and automatically have a fixed site. Because if you look at the orange block, that's the big difference. FRIAs are equipment-based, whereas fixed sites are airspace-based. And I'm going to explain that in a little bit more detail here. So you can have a FRIA all on its own. You can have a fixed site all on its own. And you can have one on top of the other. So remember, FRIAs are for equipment. Fixed sites are for airspace authorizations. So now let me get into my terrible PowerPoint skills and show you what I was able to design uh, because I know how to use shapes in PowerPoint. What we're looking at here is a, an example of a maybe a fixed flying site. Right, you, you've got a location there where there's drones that are flying. I'm using color coding to help us through because this is gonna be very important in the next few slides. So sit up, pay attention because this is something you're gonna to wanna to know. The fixed site is a three-dimensional area. Remember, fixed sites are for airspace. So you're gonna to wanna to know how high you can fly and where you can fly because you're operating in the airspace. Fria is that bluish circle that's on the ground. That is not a three-dimensional area. Frias are two-dimensional lateral boundaries. They are a location and they are for equipment. They, they really have nothing to do with the airspace in terms of authorizing you to fly. And then the red outline is, let's say it's September 16th of 2023. So remote ID is required. So let's go through a hypothetical flying situation here. In this first situation, this is not to scale, uh, you have a giant individual there flying a drone. Both are standing within a particular location. In this instance, the drone and the operator are both within the fixed site, and the drone and the operator are both within the lateral boundaries of a FRIA. In this particular instance, the drone does not need to have remote ID equipment and would not need an individual airspace authorization because both are within the fixed site and the FRIA. Now let's back the drone operator outside the FRIA. The drone is within the, the lateral boundaries of a FRIA, and it's also within the 3D cylinder of the fixed site, but the operator is standing outside. Now what? The drone does not need an airspace authorization because it's operating within the fixed site. However, because both the drone and the operator are not standing within the lateral boundaries of a FRIA, that drone would require remote ID, even though the drone itself is operating within the boundaries of a FRIA. 
So hope I'm going to let that sink in a little bit. If the operator stands outside of the FRIA, it doesn't matter where the drone is. It's going to need to be broadcasting remote ID. So let's jump to my third example here. Let's pull the drone outside of the fixed flying site. Let's pull the operator outside of that area too. So now you've got neither the operator nor the drone within the fixed site or within the lateral boundaries of a FRIA. At this point, you're going to need remote ID. You're going to need an individual airspace authorization. So remember, fixed sites and FRIAs, completely different. It's a different application process. They have different requirements. One's three-dimensional and one is two-dimensional. So I think I talked as fast as I could. So my next one is my standard slide question. If anybody has any questions, I'll be happy to help out. Let's start with Amelia. She had her hand up early and then you have a couple, Kevin, actually in the chat. So Amelia, I see you've come off uh, your mute. So go ahead and ask Kevin. Uh, good work, Kevin. This is an excellent explanation. But I do want to ask you about the aftermarket remote ID. One of the things uh, we modelers are concerned about is how that aftermarket remote ID is going to connect to the plane because we haven't seen them yet. Our worry is that we're going to be required to connect them to the balance lead of the battery. Have you any idea what the connection for power is? I, I don't. And, and so we have not required, uh, let me back up my answer a little bit. Uh, Remote ID, the broadcast modules, even the standard uh, mod or standard equipment that's going to go in are performance-based rules or performance-based requirements, meaning that the FA is not going to specify it must be placed here, it must be connected like this, and it must transmit like this. What we set up are sort of the parameters it has to meet. It, it needs to be able to broadcast this information. It needs to be able to broadcast it uh, you know, maybe on this spectrum or something like that. So we're relying on industry to innovate and create options for you. And one of the things we saw right away is that those, those innovative options didn't come in as fast as we thought, which is why we sort of delayed. We're using that enforcement discretion through December of, of this year for the standard remote ID. We are still looking for probably getting a lot of broadcast module options in the next six to eight months. So that when September of 2023 rolls around, you'll have a variety of options. But I couldn't really sit here and tell you, it's definitely not gonna need to connect to that battery lead, or it's definitely going to weigh less than this or be this shape, because really we're waiting on industry to come back to tell us how it's going to work best. Okay, well, allow me to just please say that if, if they come up with this brilliant idea of having us connect to the balance lead, they're going to create havoc for us uh, modelers, because what we see happening anytime we connect any auxiliary device to a balance lead is we often have drainage off one single cell on a battery, which will take, you know, I can get 120 flights easily out of my batteries. I take such good care of my batteries. I can get at least 120 flights out of each battery. But you start connecting these auxiliary devices to the balance lead in flight and it drains out one cell and kills the battery over a very short period of time. We need a solution that is more like receiver-based where we could plug it in as an auxiliary to the receiver and get power rather than directly to the battery lead. I'm, I'm worried that the, you know, a whole bunch of stuff's gonna roll off the market and we are told to buy, 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 and then only to find that we're ruining our batteries because we're paying $70 a piece for our batteries. Yeah, that's, it, Amelia, that's a great point. And, and that's something that's going to be really interesting to see come over the next few months. I, 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 need, to, I need to check, but I want to say we have our first mock for a broadcast module. And, and by the way, the mock is a means of compliance. It's a method mm -hmm. of which how these things are going to be built and work. Right. Um, I believe we have our first one for a broadcast module, but I, I'd have to check. I, I don't know exactly what that one looks like right now. Okay. Well, please feel free to ask. And, you know, um, I work with Raspit, Raspit and our friends. We, we can go out and test anything here. Um, let us try it and tell you our thoughts, because uh, we hate to see people invest a lot of money into uh, devices that are going to ruin a program that's already working. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Again. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. So, Donald, was your question answered? I feel like um, Kevin did get pretty thorough um, with his answers or with his slides? Uh, I, well, I guess I, I understand that, that um, educational institutions can be chartered by CBOs, but can they be CBOs themselves? Yes, because absolutely. That is a fantastic question, Donald. If, if your educational institution meets um, the requirement 
to apply as a CBO, then you can apply as a CBO and you could be recognized as a CBO. So certainly the, the, the criteria established by Congress in 44809H doesn't exclude educational institutions. It just simply says, if there's an entity that meets these requirements, then they can apply and the FAA can review and recognize. Yes. I just don't know whether uh, you know a state university is a 501c3 officially. That's my concern. Right. And, and that could be something that you, maybe there's, there's a, like a flying club that might be 501c3 that's affiliated with the school. I mean, I think there's a few different options. This is all really new in terms of how the FAA is processing. We just started processing them less than a month ago. Uh, so I think we're all going to walk through this together and learn a little bit. But there's, there's absolutely, to, to short answer your question, nothing prevents an educational institution from applying and, and meeting that criteria. Okay, thank you. Hey, Donald, just a thought. I know at least here at, at my school, um, we have our foundation and the foundation is a 501. Uh, so you may be able to go through them and, and you know, might be a little easier than getting chartered. I'm not sure. I uh, haven't gone through the charter process yet. And, um, and for Diana and Alina, maybe this is something where we could get together any institutions that are interested in applying rather than us all inventing the wheel of the CBO application. We can work together to come up with something that's got some commonality and make life a little easier for everyone. That's an excellent idea, Donald. I have um, so a real quick question about uh, the CBOs to kind of continue on with that. Sorry, I, I wanna make sure that we're going through the questions in, in order. Um, so I know Al had put a question in the chat and I want to double check with him and make sure um, that we get that question answered. Um, so Al, if you wanna come off video, you're more than welcome. I'm happy to also just read the question. Uh, what if as an educational institution, we want a FRIA at different campus locations? Um, there are currently five locations on their campus, um, and so they would need at least two FRIAs. Is that something that they can do? Yeah, and another really good question. Boy, Alina, I really like this group. they got great questions. Uh, so I, I hate to give you a government answer on that, but it, it really would depend. Uh, it would depend on those locations. So if those locations are areas where they're not that far apart, and I know that's very subjective, um, probably not. Um, if it's something where you had a legitimate reason to operate in this little area, this little area, and maybe during that application process, the FA is okay with uh, maybe making the entire campus uh, a FRIA. It would really just depend. Each, each FRIA is going to be looked at on an individual basis, meaning where is it located? What's around it? How close is the neighboring FRIA? What type of airspace is it in? And so those are going to be handled kind of individually like that. I'm speculating slightly on that just because we haven't opened up the FRIA application process yet. And we certainly haven't reviewed or approved our first FRIA location yet. Uh, but much like CBOs, uh, we're sort of walking through this with you. We have a pretty good idea of how we want it to work. But maybe we have to tweak some things based on user experience, too. We're more than willing to do that. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, Julie, we'll come back to you. Oh, there we go. I just put it in chat. I was just wondering if there was any correlation uh, for the CBO's um, requirements and the educational institution um, belonging to the UAS uh, CTI program. Yeah, nothing direct, Julie. So there's, it's really, this isn't really even an FA rule. So it, why I bring that up is because we are very structurally limited to the words and verbiage Congress used in the statute. So the answer I have to give to that is, if your school, which it happens to be a CTI school, if they meet all the requirements in 44809 to be a CBO, then absolutely, yeah, you could apply. Um, there's another great question in the chat from JC. Uh, don't know if you want to come off camera or if you just want me to go ahead and read it, JC. No, many, many thanks. As a, as a flight instructor, I, um, I use the FA Wings program to, to uh, help my uh, students uh, in, in the ground phase and then translate it over to the flight phase. 
and uh, there's been discussions over the past several years of of getting wings credit uh, for UAS operators, uh, much like in the manned realm. And there is UAS training in the FAA wings program. It's awesome. But uh, but Kevin already, uh, oh, I'm sorry, John answered the question that we're not quite there yet in getting um, credit towards uh, different levels of certification for U.S. operators. But and by the way, I'm always impressed by Kevin's briefing. Thank you very much, Kevin. You're you're terrific. Thanks, John. I'll take that. I'll take additional sunshine on this day. I appreciate it. All right. Next question um, from Devin. Uh, is there any update on when the Part 108 may be introduced for over 55 pounds and BV loss? Ah, I can't answer that question. I, I, I like my job too much. I, I can't start speculating on rulemaking. Boy, they're probably listening to me right now. Um, I, no, I, I, don't have, I don't have really anything to add. And, and if I did have something to add, I would tell you that I have something to add, but I can't tell you, but I can't even tell you that. So uh, we we just finished up the BV loss arc not too long ago. That's the Aviation Rulemaking Committee, and we've taken their uh, feedback feedback back into the process. That's like sort of gets the ball rolling on rulemaking. But um, if you if if you talk to anybody at the FAA that's been involved in rulemaking, uh, they'll tell you all the same thing, which is get out. <laughs> if you've done rulemaking once, you probably never want to do it again. So there's a lot of stuff that happens in rulemaking, as you can imagine. It's very complex, a very long process. And for something like creating a whole new part, part 108, uh, which is really going to be designed to sort of sunset those 44807 exemptions uh, that are out there, um, that's going to take a lot of work from a lot of really smart people too. Uh, but unfortunately, I can't speculate on any of that that's happening other than we are aware, you are hearing rumors about it for a reason. It's a process that's ongoing. Thank you, Kevin. I know, and we get a lot of questions about 108 um, and that's nothing official yet. So uh, Zach, I see that you have two questions, go. I do. So the first one, uh, Kevin, back on slide 21, I believe it was uh, when talking about CBOs, uh, it, it, there was some verbiage on there about furthering model aviation or model aeronautics um, as, as part of the requirements for, for a CBO there. Um, there you go. Mission is the furtherance of model aviation. Um, so when we think model aviation, a lot of times we, we think, you know, exactly what you have on the screen right there. Um, are we including, you know, FPV flying things like that as, as meeting that mission of furtherance of model aviation? Yes, absolutely. Uh, keep, keep in mind, uh, this was written by Congress, so they may not use the terms that we've all come to know and love. Uh, so we, we mentioned model aviation. That includes pretty much anything unmanned uh, that's flown recreationally, right? It's, it's interesting you bring this up, Zach, because I get, it's, I, we use drones a lot. We, we pretty much use the word drone to apply to everything. And for as often as I use drones, I, I get some pushback from the RC aircraft enthusiast, you know, stop calling my remote control aircraft a drone. It's not a drone. Not everything's a drone. So I, I, I kind of get blasted on both sides. But yes, to answer your question, model aviation includes everything unmanned recreationally. Great. And then my, my second question, because I know that I'm going to get this, um, whether it's through the fast side or through the outreach. Uh, when we talked about the fixed site FRIA drone operator, drone operating inside the fixed site FRIA, but operator uh, out. And I'm, I'm sure you've gotten this one before, so you know where I'm going here. Um, how, how, how do we respond to folks about the, because the, at, at that point, you're talking about the, the person on the ground and not the aircraft, right? And, and the great. aircraft then is, you know, is under FAA jurisdiction, but the person on the ground. So, I, I, like I said, you, you know where I'm going with this. Where, where's, where's that justification that we can pull out when we get that question? Uh, are you talking about the justification of why the person themselves have to be standing within the FRIA? Yeah, why you would need a remote ID if your drone is flying in a FRIA. So one of the things you have to remember, remote ID is, is sort of dual functioning in terms of it will broadcast information uh, about the drone's flight parameters or the model aircraft's flight parameters, but it'll also broadcast where it took off from or where that controller station is located. 
So there's a control station piece to remote ID. So what we're saying is if you're going to take advantage of operating in an area, again, this is an equipment requirement, right? You're operating in an area that does not require remote ID equipment, both the control station and the drone will need to be within that lateral boundary because you couldn't be standing outside uh, the, an area where we authorize no remote ID equipment operating your drone, which is sending a signal back from the control station where it has to identify where you are, but yet you don't have that requirement. So that's the reason that I emphasize it's a two-dimensional space. And because the control station and the drone itself are components of a standard remote ID broadcast, both the control station, assuming you're holding the control station, and the drone would need to be within that lateral boundary. Sounds good. Did, I, did I help or did I make it worse? No, no, you did help. I'm just thinking about the, the next things that come up. Like I, I get a lot of weird questions, uh, but between Facebook and fast team outreach and things like that. And, uh, you know, I actually had somebody bring up uh, in, in regards to this. Well, what about with the national parks? You can stand outside the national parks and fly in the national park all day long, uh, as long as you don't take off and land from there. And so they're just, like I said, I get a lot of weird questions and I want to be able to address it in the right way. Yeah, and that's where I would go back to just reminding them that remote ID is an equipment thing. It's not an airspace thing, right? So make that hard divide. So absolutely, if they national parks say you can't take off or land your drone there, so I'm going to be super savvy, stand right outside the gate and fly my drone over the national park. By the way, I don't recommend that. I don't think you make a lot of friends that way. But legally speaking, you could do that, right? Uh, because that's an airspace Thing. They they don't regulate the airspace uh, above that national park, or at least the national parks don't regulate that airspace. With FRIA, it's the equipment piece. It's what your drone has on board for equipment. Gotcha. Thank you. That makes it easier to have that conversation. Okay. And actually, this makes a really good segue into there. There are a number of comments about this specifically. Um, part ninety three airspace. I know John Soiler, John Sawyer, Michael Trailer. You all have been talking about this, um, John Meehan as well. So if you all want to come off of mute and, and just kind of bring us into the discussion here. All right. Uh, so where we fly at in the, in the panhandle uh, specifically is Eglin Air Force Base uh, controls much of where I fly. So I, I'm almost every campus I have is in controlled air, airspace. Uh, and we're all covered by Part 93. So I already have to have uh, very detailed airspace authorizations to fly. So uh, that's why I was looking at the uh, the fixed site uh, because of our airspace requirements uh, and uh, the possibility of free is and things like that. Uh, that's what I'm looking yeah. at. Yeah, Michael, good, good point that when the airspace becomes more complex, everything changes a little bit. The risk changes, all sorts of different things changes. You're probably more than well aware of. Uh, but so that's something that is real. That, that's why I, went, I made my previous comment, which is these are looked at individually, just like fixed sites would be looked at individually. You Let's say you want to put up a fixed site there. So you don't have to do this complex airspace authorization piece every time. That could happen. It, it might not. They might say, hey, no, we just we can't accept that level of risk because of the your the Air Force base or the military operation or the critical infrastructure that might be nearby. Uh, but they also might accept it depending on mitigations you're putting into place. Yes, so the we've, we've already had airspace authorizations, the same airspace authorizations renewed every year for four years. So I don't know why a fixed site would be an issue at that point. It probably wouldn't. I was talking more in generalities. So if, if you've been getting authorizations to operate there uh, for four years, I don't think setting up a fixed site would prove to be that much more difficult, other than they may ask you to do a few different things because now they're not going to know individually where those drones and when those drones might be flying. But I, it shouldn't be too difficult if you've already had those authorizations. The FRIA piece might be more challenging. Uh, simply because of what you're nearby. I, you, you you get near nuclear power facilities, electrical grid stations that are critical infrastructure pieces, areas of national security, things like that. Probably a lot more difficult, although I'll never say never, uh, a lot more difficult to get an, a, a free location established there because they probably want to know what's operating around that area. Okay. 
John, do you have anything? No, my comment was specifically for you, Mike, because um, okay. I know that you know your your operations, and you know the last thing I would want is for you to apply for a free and then be told no, you know, and then now yeah. where are we? So I just wanted to interject that into the conversation specifically for your operation. Yeah, uh, unlikely or not, uh, we've had to go buy out all new, uh, brand new equipment because of the state of Florida. So I think we'll be completely remote ID compliant. Uh, at least it better be with everything I just bought. So, and um, NDAA compliant as well. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, they're 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 all sitting over there, so I should be good to go on that that end. I'm just making sure. Um, you know, very interested in the fixed site because you know every year I'm going through renewing multiple airspace authorizations. Um, but we we can fly pretty much everywhere down here, so we're doing pretty good with that part with the Part 93 airspace. This has been great discussion, and I know it's coming close to time that we need to stop. Devin, I see that you came off mute. Yeah. You have a question? Yep, I'll uh, ask one quick question. Um, is there a radius for in a recreational pilot to fly under the, the CBO organization? So say like someone here, I don't know, California is flying for someone in Florida, like they're using that CBO guidance for that 4408. Yeah. Uh, so, I, I, so no is the the short answer. So you you could go to um, I mean, you could go right now. We've got one FA recognized CBO. You could go to their website. You could pull down their safety guidelines and fly anywhere in the country. Uh, it's it's not a location based requirement. It, it just like it's not a membership based requirement. Uh, what it really is is the FA is saying we we've, we've looked at this organization. We've reviewed their safety guidelines. We find them acceptable for what we want, and that matches up with 44809. Therefore, we recognize them officially as a community-based organization. Anybody can go to their website and follow their safety guidelines. All right. To wrap this up, um, don't worry about putting the slide up, Zach. Um, we Just to tell you some things that are coming up next, we already know 200 for 2023. We need you all to be our ambassadors. Uh, those of you who are uh, not a CTI school, uh, but your industry governments, if you have any contacts, get that information to us um, and we'll definitely reach out to them. Um, NCAT will be working with us for that whole uh, recruitment um, and keep your eyes, ears open for the regional events in the spring. We hope to see you at Droning On uh, and other conferences that are coming up. If you yourself, are going to be in attendance and we don't, you, for whatever reason, we aren't there, please be, again, that ambassador uh, to spread the good word about what we're doing. Uh, lastly, a couple things that we have going on. We're actually working on um, building out kind of a sub group of our group for high school clubs. And I say clubs because, you know, the Civil Air Patrol, 4-H, others that are training students around that middle school, high school age. We want to capture that, especially if they're linked with your school and you're giving credits for that. We want to know that. We want to uh, bring in faculty to some of our meetings so that they get this great information that Kevin provided today. We're also, uh, Central Region is going to be leading an uh, agricultural program. Uh, Amelia, I definitely want to hook you up with some of those folks as we move along with that, and also a veterans program. Uh, you know, there are so many um, veterans out there. They may have some disabilities and or just need that uh, workforce, um, working for workforce development, that there will be opportunities to include them. And if you have a program, Please um, let us know. All of this information is important. It, don't ever think that what you're doing is not. We love to get your messages. Send it to that uh, CTI email box. Um, and we look forward to our next meeting. We'll have a full CTI uh, towards the end of the year. And then we'll start back with a consortium uh, early in 2023. Any last comments, um, questions that you want to address right at this minute, we could go a little bit over. I just want to take a second and, and thank everybody for showing up here, uh, whether it's the CTI schools. I see a lot of a lot of our supporters out there. You know, I, I saw some folks from from drone up uh, Mr. Brewer and uh, lots of FAA folks out there, you know, Kevin, Amelia, 
um, Scott for, for taking the time to talk to us. Um, keep an eye on the NCAT website. We are going to be doing some, uh, some changes here over the next couple of weeks, some updates there. Uh, if you have anything to add as far as curriculum, resources, uh, links that you want to see uh, linked to your pages, uh, please let us know. Um, also, any events that you have going on, uh, we do have our events section, so you can actually add your event onto the onto the calendar there, and we will help push it out through our social media platforms. So, just once again, thanks for everybody for joining us today. All right. Well, we'll see you next time, and uh, some of you maybe we'll even see sooner before we have our next meeting. We hope hope so anyway. Elena, any final comments? No, just thank you all for being here and have a great holiday season. And there's some great information on the chat. So make sure you save the chat if you're interested in, uh, in reviewing that information later. Great, great idea. Thanks again, presenters, Kevin, especially. Anytime. Thanks for having me, everyone. Bye. Have a great holiday.